Welcome to Radboud Reflects at Home, the digital programming of Radboud Reflects that lets you think further in times of Corona. My name is Frank van Kaspel, program writer for Radboud Reflects, and I have the pleasure of introducing a lecture by Mark Schlors, who is a professor of mind and language at Radboud University. In his lecture, Professor Schlors discusses the main focus of his current research. He investigates the nature and function of social conventions, like driving on the right side of the road or shaking hands. And he considers their role in creating social cohesion and friction. He argues that when it comes to social friction, for example in multicultural societies, we often see beliefs and values as a source of conflict, but we overlook the important role of social conventions and habits. His position has wide-ranging societal implications, and we invite you to share your thoughts in the comment section below the video. Have fun watching. So welcome everybody uh, to this Rutbat Reflects lecture entitled Force of Habit. My name is Mark Slaws. I'm Professor of Philosophy of Mind and Cognition at Rutbat University. And uh, the subtitle of this talk is Why Cultural Friction is Not About Ideas, and that gives you a better impression of what it is that I will be arguing. Um, the talk is subdivided in four sections and the first section is the section in which I will try to explain what, is, is it, what it is exactly that I will be arguing. It is, it is called Convictions versus Conventions as Explanations for Social Cohesion and, so, and Cultural Friction. That's a, a mouthful but I'll try to explain what I mean. So it is generally acknowledged by basically everyone that sharing culture um, connects the members of a group, that it, um, that it provides a degree of social cohesion. Uh, and that it is also generally acknowledged that the flip side of this is that it, um, it differentiates uh, and it distinguishes different groups from, from each other. So while sharing culture makes the members within one group cohere, they, um, the culture also uh, makes it the case that these members differentiate themselves from uh, members of other groups. So basically, social cohesion and cultural friction are each other's flip side. So the first question I would like to ask is, what is it in culture that does this? What is it that makes culture connect people and also differentiate and disconnect people from different groups. Now, the standard answer to this question is one that is, for instance, represented here in this book by uh, Yuval Noah Harari, called Sapiens. And Harari thinks that what connects, what makes culture connect people is the fact that uh, a culture allows us to believe in uh, the same myths that we collectively believe in the same fictions and that by collectively believing the same thing, um, we get to cooperate in a flexible way uh, with large numbers of people. And the myths that he speaks of uh, can be rather varied. I mean, he speaks of the biblical creation story, the dreamtime myths of the Aboriginals of Australia, and he speaks of national myths of modern states as basically fulfilling the same function. So here's another quote. Uh, he says, Myth and fiction accustomed people to think in certain ways, to behave in accordance with certain standards, to want certain things, and to observe certain rules. And they thereby created artificial instincts that enabled millions of strangers to cooperate effectively. This network of artificial instincts is called culture. Now, I think this last bit is perfectly, completely spot on. Um, to characterize culture as a network of artificial instincts that allow strangers to cooperate effectively is exactly right, I think. Where I am less sure is that this network of artificial instincts can completely be understood and explained in terms of our collectively believing in the same myths and fictions. So that is what I want to question in this talk. So Harari concentrates on the social cohesion aspect of culture, um, but there is also the flip side of that, namely the, the cultural friction side of the story. Um, but basically you find the same position there. So here's 
Jonathan Turner, famous sociologist, and he says, cultural conflict is caused by differences in cultural values and beliefs that place people at odds with one another. So what Harari and Turner agree on, and many other people agree on as well, is that what connects us are conventions, so that's ideas, beliefs, myths, values, and that is also what divides people that belong to different cultures. So cultural frictions are due to differences in convictions, in what I will call convictions. Um, now, culture does not only exist of conventions, or sorry, convictions, it also consists of cultural conventions or habits or customs, whatever you would like to call them. Um, and here I'm thinking of things such as social etiquette, ways of greeting each other, for instance, or of the way we dress clothing. Um, I'm also thinking of the styling of public space. You can immediately see that the, the, the top picture is some Asian culture and uh, the bottom picture is probably Eastern Europe or Russia or something like that. Uh, and we can also think of architecture. Uh, the left picture is pretty clearly the UK and the right hand picture is rather obviously Holland. If you're familiar with those countries, you can see that you know, with a blink of an eye, immediately, you immediately recognize that. So those are cultural conventions. There are more cultural conventions, but I'll concentrate on these. Now, if you look at the literature on intercultural communication, for instance, or the literature on how to become a successful expert, um, you will find that most of that literature concentrates on conventions, on habits, on, on customs, if you like. Um, but if you look at the literature that tries to explain social cohesion and cultural conflict and the role of culture in that, you will find much less reference, I mean, almost no reference at all to uh, conventions and a lot of emphasis on convictions, as we saw in the case of Harari and Turner. So why is that? Well, there is a, a rather obvious explanation um, because in both cases, what we need is an explanation of why it is that people cling to their conventions and their convictions, why people adhere to them, why, why they feel strongly about them. And in the case of convictions, this is really easy to explain because people think they have reasons to believe what they believe. They have reasons to hold the values that they hold. Uh, and this might be... I mean, from a psychological point of view, we might actually ask whether people actually do have good reasons. But that's another view. People view themselves as having reasons to believe what they believe. More importantly, perhaps, beliefs and values and myths and stories give meaning to our lives. They are not arbitrary. They, are, they really structure our lives. Um, so it is pretty easy and pretty easy to understand why it is that we strongly adhere to our beliefs and values and fictions and myths. Um, it's in fact so easy that many people do not even attempt to explain this. And this is not bad. This is not a, a bad thing. It is really easy to understand why people cling to their beliefs. But it's a completely different story if we move along to conventions. And this is because everybody agrees that conventions are arbitrary, that they are conspicuously arbitrary. Uh, for instance, we shake hands as a way of greeting, but we readily acknowledge that, uh, you know, bowing might do the trick just as well, or tongue protrusion, or waving, you know, or whatever gesture. It doesn't really matter which gesture we opt for, as long as we all do the same thing. Um, so everybody agrees that shaking hands is just an arbitrary gesture. And in our culture, that basically means saying hello or saying goodbye. Uh, but it could have been anything else. And we all acknowledge this. So it's this arbitrary nature that makes it difficult to understand why it is that people cling so strongly to these conventions. So this is the asymmetrical situation that we are in. It's very easy to understand why people cling to their convictions. It's really difficult to explain and understand why people cling to their conventions. What I would like to do in this talk is to uh, propose an explanation of why it is that people cling to their conventions. I will argue that conventions have an important but overlooked cognitive function. 
I will argue that this function allows us to see why conventions are quite possibly and quite probably actually more important than convictions when it comes to explaining social cohesion and cultural friction. And I will say something very briefly at the end of this talk about how this change of view might affect the way in which we deal with um, cultural frictions, for instance, in multicultural societies. I'll be brief about that because there's, there's more to say than what I have time for. Right, so in the first, so in the second section, I will try to explain why I think that um, cultural conventions are in, in, intricately inter, intertwined with um, the fact that humans divide labor. And by dividing labor, uh, I mean not just dividing labor in an economic sense, but in a cultural, social cultural sense just as well. I'll try to explain what I mean. First, humans divide labor in, a, in an incredibly complex way. There are many other animals that, that divide labor. Uh, they're very interesting examples, but to cut a very long story short, the way in which humans do this is incom incomparably more complex than the way in which animals do this. Um, and that division of labor gives us a lot. I mean, um, it allows us for specialization, for focused expertise, if you like. It allows us to put the right person on the right task. It reduces a waste of cognitive resources on, for instance, task switching or on learning new skills and also on redundant problem solving. If one person in a group can solve a problem, there's no need for other people in the same group to solve that same problem. This one person should just give the solution to everybody else and everybody else is happy. So also here, to cut a long story short, dividing labor, um, dividing roles and tasks, if you like, um, is really, really, really helpful for, uh, for human beings. It raises the standards of living. It really enhances the chances of survival of human groups way back in our evolutionary past. This will become important later on. Um, so it's, it's pretty good for us. Um, for now, it's important that human societies everywhere divide labor, divide roles and tasks, if you don't want this economic uh, connotation, uh, in an incredibly complex way. Everybody in a, in a human society plays their own role, plays their own task, performs their own tasks. So this is something I already said. Uh, division of labor is not just an economic uh, issue in which you know people have different professions, but it's also a social cultural uh, phenomenon. So here I have a picture of a of a courtroom in which everybody plays their own specific role. But you might also think of I don't know an orchestra in which everybody plays their specific role, or a sports team, or a family, or a group of friends. Everywhere where humans get together and collaborate, they divide labor, they divide roles and tasks. So let's take that as a point of departure. What I want to claim is that um, cultural conventions actually facilitate the coordination that is involved in dividing roles and tasks. But usually if you talk about the coordination of roles and tasks, people think of something like this. Each worker has a specific task. So coordination means something like deciding on who does what. And that's a very interesting question. There's a lot of books written on exactly this topic, and many authors emphasize the remarkable fact, for instance, that coordination in this sense does often not require a central coordinator, that it is something that emerges, so to speak. So these books, for instance, are really well worth reading. They are about this type of coordination. What I want to talk about, however, is something way more mundane and trivial and everyday. Uh, a different kind of coordination, namely the, the here and now interaction between people who carry out different roles and tasks in a very day-to-day -day physical embodied situation. So. If you look at this picture, for instance, you can see that everybody is basically busy with their own tasks. So this is a 
let's assume this is a cook who is buying an apple from this lady to make, I don't know, to make her meal with. Uh, and this is an apple picking lady who picks apples and sells them at the side of the road. Um, this is probably a painter that doesn't want to be bothered by anyone else. These people are dividing, I don't know, the fish they caught probably in the morning. Um, and here you can see people who are talking to each other. You might imagine that this lady is actually telling that man um, how to reach the next town. These are all forms, very trivial, but important forms of coordination. And they involve first and foremost finding each other when needed for the exchange of goods, information and services. For most of the roles and tasks that we perform, we need to contact other people every now and then for the exchange of goods, information and services. But there's a second kind of coordination and that is basically not being in each other's way. Um, usually people live together in a fairly small uh, space. When everybody's busy doing their own thing, um, most of the time it is really helpful to let each other be and to, to give each other space, so to speak, to do what, what it is that people have to do. So these are the very trivial forms of coordination I want to talk about. And I would like to persuade you that cultural conventions are actually, um, well, they, they facilitate this kind of in, uh, this coordination and they facilitate it to such an extent that we really can't do without them. So here are a couple of examples that are meant to illustrate how this first type of coordination is facilitated by cultural conventions. Finding each other when needed for the exchange of goods, information and services. First function, function of, uh, of cultural conventions is what we might call signposting. So for instance, here you can see people who wear different uniforms and by dip, which are definitely cultural conventions. And by wearing these different clothes, they signal or they advertise their profession. And this can be handy when we need these people. Um, in this case, it's not about uniforms, but it's about formal and informal dress. You can immediately see that this guy is probably not going to go to school, whereas this young lady is. And this guy is probably going to some formal occasion. Um, signals, cultural signals, conventional signals that advertise the function of certain rooms in a house, for instance. That's also signposting. Uh, making certain gestures that show whether or not you are open to certain exchanges. But we can also think of architecture. So if you look at these buildings, it is really clear, it's immediately clear what the function of these buildings is. Uh, and we can see that from the cultural conventions that are uh, present here. So you can immediately see this is a gas station, this is a church, this is just a house you know, people live in, and this is probably an office building. But you, here, I'm less, I'm less certain. Okay, so signposting is an important function of cultural conventions. Another function is to provide us with standardized behavior for specific interactions, templates for interactions, if you like. Um, so here we can see, just by, you know, by looking at this picture, uh, just by looking at the, the, the way in which the people are organized and in which they look at each other, this is very probably a job interview. This is a birthday in which there is, you know, something is celebrated. This is a lady who gets a checkup at, the, uh, at her physician. And here's a graduation ceremony. These are all exchanges of goods, information and services. And cultural conventions provide specific templates for this. Another function is the signaling of transactions within these exchanges. So here, this is you know, shaking hands, is a way of saying goodbye or a way of saying hello, of opening an exchange. Uh, toasting is a way of marking a certain event. Uh, this is for opening meetings or closing uh, meetings with more than one person. These gestures are meant to convey something like, oh, this is so stupid of me and I recognize this. Um, this is all signaling transactions in exchanges. And finally, we, we can think of the signaling of intentions or attitudes. So these people definitely signal their attitude towards society. And this guy signals an attitude towards an individual, probably. This one signals an 
attitude towards conventions in general. You can only be unconventional given the fact that there are conventions. You require conventions to be unconventional. But this is, uh, this is signaling something else, like, you know, I'm available for questioning or whatever. Uh, and this is basically, oh gosh, I need to go. Second, the second type of, of coordination is not being in each other's ways. And for this, we have cultural conventions that pertain to behavior, behavioral rules. So think, for instance, of queuing, of opening the door for each other, of not speaking in a library so that basically people can go about and do their own thing in the library. This is also a way of not being in each other's way, not just spatially, but not bothering each other. Uh, or keeping to one side of an escalator, that's a pretty obvious one. Um, but we can also think of spatial arrangements. And these are also, once again, cultural conventions. Ways in which we organize our offices, our courtrooms, in which different people with different functions have specific places. Classrooms, same thing. Different function, different place, and you can immediately see how that works. Counters in shops. And... Um, yeah, this is an assembly line in a factory. This is probably less clear, but there are uh, millions of tiny little conventions in such, um, in such setups that facilitate the coordination of different roles. So these are a lot of examples, but I hope the general, just the general idea is clear. Um, cultural conventions allow us facilitate uh, the very basic mundane interaction between people carrying out their own different roles. I forgot this one, spatial arrangements. Uh, here it's also pretty obvious that you know this is where pedestrians need to go, this is where cyclists need to go, this is where cars need to go, um, so as to not be in each other's way and allow each other to basically pursue their own tasks and role um, as well as possible. So these are all forms of coordination uh, that are facilitated by cultural conventions. Now, you might think that this is a sort of optional extra, that, that conventions facilitate coordination, um, but we can do without them. And that is correct. We can do without uh, conventions. But this comes at a cost, and the cost is a cognitive cost. And in order to give you a first feel of what it is I'm after, let me give you an example and then move on to the cognition bit. So here's a comparison. Look at these three games. Um, they have something in common. They're all chess games, so they all have the same rules. They also differ in an important respect. Uh, they have different conventions for recognizing the various pieces. Yeah, so the signposting in this case is done in different ways. Now you can ask yourself, would you play one of these games just as well as this one? My guess is, and this is probably more than a guess, that you would play this game way better than these games. And this is because you can see within the blink of an eye that this is a rook, this is a bishop, this is a king, this is a pawn, um, because you're used to these conventions. So these conventions allow you to see immediately what the function of the various pieces is, and that allows you to concentrate on your strategy in the game, on trying to win and trying to, I don't know, see what the strategy of your opponent is going to be, etc., etc. Whereas if you, have to if you have to play one of these games, so suppose you're playing this beer game here, um, you would constantly have to remind yourself that this is a rook. And that this is a pawn which is hardly distinguishable, for instance, from a bishop or, well, it's, it's a difficult situation, right? So especially if the game is, is you know, underway and the, the pieces are all over, all over the board, um, you really would have to concentrate in order to see what the situation is. And that concentration takes you, I mean, it takes a lot of cognitive effort and that goes at the expense of your ability to play chess. It goes to the expense of your own um, strategy and the quality of your game. So in all likelihood, you are playing. The, you will play this game way better. And that is due to the cognitive function of 
cultural conventions in this case. So in the next section, I will look at how this works with um, cognition. All right, so the third section is called multitasking and cultural evolution. And this is where we're going to look at cognition specifically and the way cognition is involved in this whole story of the function of uh, cultural conventions. So if you look at these people, um, this is a typical situation in which everybody is busy with their own tasks. You might imagine that this guy is going home, uh, this lady is going to her work, this one is texting a friend and this one is texting a colleague. Um, they're not bumping into each other, they adhere to the you know, cultural acceptable norm of you know, how close you can be to each other. More importantly, they adhere to the norm that you should cross streets at the zebra crossing and not anywhere else. So they are coordinating with each other, but they also coordinating with the cars that you can't see here in the picture. Everybody's coordinating with everybody and everybody is busy with their own tasks and roles. So in everyday life, we carry out our tasks and we coordinate with others, more or less simultaneously. Now, this is a form of multitasking. The term multitasking is a bit controversial. Some people say that multitasking doesn't exist, that it really consists of frequent task switching. Um, that's fine as far as I'm concerned. I'll speak of multitasking, but if you would like to hear frequent task switch switching, that's okay. The point is, the question that we need to ask is, why is it that we don't notice this frequent task switching or this multitasking as an extra cognitive strain? And this question is pertinent because people are notoriously bad at multitasking. This much is uncontroversial. Um, and the answer to the question why it is that we don't feel this strain is because we automatize our interactions. So let's go, let's, let's first look at uh, examples, uh, standard examples of multitasking. Uh, I'll, just, I'll just speak about the first example, driving a car and having a conversation. It's a standard example of multitasking. And we all know that people are able to do this. People are, most, most people are really good at this actually. But only, and this is the crucial point, only if you're an experienced driver. If you're an experienced driver, you have no problems driving your car, minding the other traffic, minding the traffic signs, minding the traffic lights, and at the same time having a contentful conversation with your buy rider. If you're not an experienced driver, if you're a novice driver, you have to learn to drive, then things are completely different. Then you need to focus on the driving itself, you know, the technical stuff with the car, the traffic, the traffic lights, the signs, you need to focus on that. And that focus um, will usually not allow you to have a conversation at the same time. So this is standardly noted in the literature on multitasking. What is usually required for us to be able to multitask is the automatization of one of the tasks. In this case, in this case of this example, uh, driving a car. But in the case uh, that we're really interested in, which is uh, this type of multitasking, it's multitasking that consists of carrying out your own task and coordinating it with other people. Um, it is the coordination that gets automatized. And this is where cultural conventions come in. This is what in uh, philosophy of cognition is called cognitive offloading. Um, and cognitive offloading is something like shaping your environment, in this case, your cultural environment in such a way that certain tasks require little or no effort. That's cognitive offloading. Um, and the point obviously is that cultural and cultural conventions allow us to offload cognition that is aimed at the coordination, the very basic day-to-day -day coordination of our own roles and tasks with the tasks and roles of other people. So cultural conventions allow us to automatize one of the tasks of the continuous ubiquitous multitasking that most of us are involved in, maybe all of us are involved in, um, and by doing that they provide a kind of cognitive offloading. 
Yeah? They make the task, they make the combination of combining coordination with carrying out your own tasks um, cognitively bearable, so to speak. So does it mean, once again, that we can't do this multitasking without cultural conventions? Well, no, it doesn't, because we can move to other cultures and maybe not coordinate as well and as easily as we are able to do that in our own culture, but we usually we manage. But the point is that managing comes at a cost, and that cost is really well known from the phenomenon of culture shock. Um, culture shock is basically, um, well, it's, it's just, here it's depicted as irritability, but it is usually uh, an emotionally more... Um, Devastating. It, it can really be a devastating effect. It can lead to depression, for instance, uh, and it's it occurs when you um, when you have passed an initial state of euphoria of being in a new country, you know, having new experiences, meeting new people. When you really have to settle, when you have to go back to a normal situation of being able to carry out your task and coordinating those with other people, um, things become really stressful when you are not able to do that coordination as smoothly and as easily as you are used to in your own culture. And that leads to uh, severe feelings of distress that are known as culture shock. So yes, we can do without cultural conventions, but really not for a long time and actually not for a whole society. A society that consists of people carrying out intric—I mean, very, very, very many different tasks and roles that are intricately, intricately interconnected. Such a society cannot do without conventions that facilitate those kinds of interactions. So the claim is that dividing labor goes hand in hand with having cultural conventions, and the claim is also that there is a cognitive reason for this because it's only with cultural conventions that we are able to sustain complex division of labor for a long time. Now, it's pretty obvious, and it's, it's generally agreed on, that dividing labor has been immensely important for human evolutionary success, that it enhances the, the chances of group survival immensely, that it enhances our standards of living uh, immensely. That is not controversial. But then you might think, okay, so if dividing labor is important for our evolutionary success, and if dividing labor really cannot do without cultural conventions, then there might be reasons to think, evolutionary reasons, to think that we are sort of hardwired or at least wired by evolution to be susceptible to cultural conven conventions, that we really um, have a sort of inborn inclination to adopt and accept um, cultural conventions. And this is indeed something that seems to be confirmed by experiments. So I'll, I'll show you two experiments that really uh, that deserve more attention than I can give them here. I, I should be brief about them. I'll only explain this uh, experiment here by Horner and Whiten in 2005. It's one of the best experiments of the past decades as far as I'm concerned. So. Um, this is a situation in which infants, human infants and chimpanzees alike are shown a box with a stick on top of it and uh, the experimenter shows what you can do with the box and the stick. The experimenter takes the stick and performs a ritual. I'll, I'll be brief about that. It's, it's an elaborate ritual with, you know, with tapping and putting the, uh, the, the stick in a hole, etc. After the ritual, the, uh, the experimenter opens a hatch, the bottom of the box, and retrieves a treat, and then signals to both the chimpanzee and the infant that they should um, basically copy this. And they do that. They copy the whole thing. They copy the ritual with the stick, and after that, the, the hatch. So, so far, so good. No difference between human beings and chimpanzees. But then, here's the, the second part of the experiment, in which the box suddenly is not opaque but transparent. And that allows you to see that whatever is done with the stick, the whole ritual of the stick that, you know, that the, the experimenter starts with, is completely meaningless and useless. There is no secret hatch, there's no secret mechanism that is triggered by the ritual with the stick so that the hatch can be opened, which is something that you might assume uh, at, 
at first at least is the case, you can see that the ritual with the stick is pointless. Now, what's interesting is the difference between the responses of the chimpanzees and uh, human infants. Chimpanzees completely leave the stick for what it is. They don't touch the stick. They immediately go for the hatch. Now, that seems to be the rational attitude, right? Why do something that is completely unnecessary if your main aim is to retrieve a treat? And here, the chimpanzees look smarter than the human infants because the infants copy everything. They do see that the ritual is pointless and yet they copy, copy it meticulously. So it, it looks like human beings are less smart than uh, chimpanzees here, but from the point of view of the, the, the hypothesis that I've been trying to convince you of, the hypothesis that uh, cultural conventions play an important cognitive role, um, the whole thing might look differently. Because um, human beings divide labor in a complex way, and chimpanzees, they divide labor, but not in a very complex way. Um, so the hypothesis here is that we are hardwired, we are susceptible to, uh, to cultural conventions and to cultural rituals uh, because there is an evolutionary function for that. There's an evolutionary purpose that is served by this susceptibility. Namely, it enables us, it makes us ready to develop complexly divided labor, which is very good for our evolutionary development. Um, I'll leave the other experiment for what it is because it takes me too long to explain it, but the point there is basically the same. So now, last section. Um, what I have tried to argue is that the function that conventions play in our cognitive household, so to speak, is such that if we want to you know, carry out our daily tasks and roles, we automatically tend towards those who share our conventions. We have, a, we have a huge preference for being around and interacting with people who share our conventions, being in an environment, a physical environment, um, that is replete with conventions that we are familiar with, because this allows us to uh, perform our tasks, play our roles, uh, and coordinate those with the roles of other people in the way that's sort of cognitively most efficient for us. Um, as soon as we encounter uh, situations, environments with different uh, conventions, there is a little bit, cogn little, our cognitive strain increases a little bit. Usually we can handle that, it's no problem at all. But the more strange influences, the more cognition is required to deal with those. So the claim I want to make is that this actually explains, this is a very mundane and very trivial, but still a deep explanation for social cohesion on the one hand, but also for cultural frictions on the other hand. Now, if you compare this with, uh, with convictions, you get a strange situation. Um, one thing that we should note is, for instance, if you look at the Dutch culture, and if you look at the variety of beliefs that people hold, well, these beliefs can vary wildly within our culture. That is well known. People believe really different things. Some people believe incredibly strange things, you know, from our point of view, at least. Um, we do not share beliefs. With values, it might be a little bit different, but even there, people have fairly different values. But then, if you look at conventions, such as shaking hands or you know, architectural conventions, for instance, social etiquette, we are conspicuously homogeneous. People who do not share values, who do not share beliefs, do share conventions. So the claim is that conventions are probably more important for explaining social cohesion and also cultural conflict, and I'll come to that later, um, than, uh, cultural, than cultural convictions, than beliefs and values and myths, uh, if you like. Um, there's also no reason to think that the difference in belief within a given culture are less deep than the differences in belief between cultures. Conversely, and this is the, the, the same point, but now from the other side, conversely, 
there is definitely reason to think that the that the differences in conventions between culture is much 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 are, are much bigger much more serious than the differences within a culture so what makes cultures homogeneous i claim is conventions not convictions that is the uh, that is the the story that i would like to convince you of and now i have a little time left but i want to say something about um the fact that this might actually um, influence the way in which we deal with uh, problems in you know problems connected with cultural frictions in multicultural societies, for instance, uh, I want to mention three three things that we might do differently or that we might uh, focus on. Uh, there is more to be said here, but this just gives you a flavor of of how this view can change our way of dealing with such problems. So for one thing, and this is the obvious one, in courses on citizenship and integration, we should not merely focus on facts, which is usually the case now. We should not merely focus on beliefs and values, which is a little bit the case now, but we should focus on conventions, on how to interact with each other. And, and really, the more trivial, the better. That is what we should focus on, and that is probably what promotes integration in a way that's you know way more serious and way more important than knowing about the facts of the country that you uh, live in because you you will you will learn these facts but learning about conventions is a whole different story so focus on conventions there too there is almost no focus on conventions in courses on citizenship and integration nowadays so this is one thing that i would like to call attention to another thing is that we should definitely oh Here's the, uh, the chessboard again, uh, it's, but the example is hopefully clear. Um, another thing is that we really should be aware of the fact that a lot of cultural friction is in fact due to or connected with conventions. Um, and with the, peop with the fact that people don't feel um, as well and as, as well at ease with different conventions, um, than they feel with you know within their own conventions, and that this is actually a cause for cultural friction. Um, the point is that this seems so trivial that we have a tendency to rationalize that kind of friction in terms of differences of opinion, differences of beliefs and values. So here's a striking example of how that happens. This is the 2009 referendum in Switzerland on the ban of minarets in Switzerland. By that time, there were only four minarets in uh, Switzerland. And this is very clearly a conflict over cultural conventions, in this case, architectural conventions. Now, everybody feels that this is so trivial that you can't really, um, you can't do that, a ban on a convention. But then again, people really feel, apparently felt, uh, uneasy about the presence of these different conventions. Um, and what happened then was that at some point in, uh, um, I think a couple of days before the, the actual vote, um, a couple of days before that, it looked like the, like the ban was not going to make it. They, they would certainly not get more than 40% or so of the votes for a ban. And then somebody on television said, well, this is not about conventions. This is about beliefs. Um, minarets are a symbol for the fact that Muslims want to impose Sharia in uh, Switzerland. And that changed everything. Now suddenly you have a, a reason that you can understand. We have differences of opinion. And then that, that changed the vote. There was a 55% or something like that vote for a ban on minarets, which is still there. Um, as far as I'm concerned, this is a case of rationalizing a convention-based friction. Right? The friction really is convention-based. This is not to say um, that uh, uh, cultural frictions based on belief are serious and cultural uh, uh, frictions based on conventions are not serious. Now, the point is, we should really take this feeling of unease that's connected with conventions seriously, and we don't need to rationalize that in terms of uh, beliefs in order for it to be taken seriously. 
So this is one thing. Beware of rationalizing. Beware of the fact that we have convention-based friction and that we should not rationalize it, but recognize it for what it is. So what can we do then about this type of friction? Well, a lot of literature shows that exposure is a good thing, that if we want to uh, promote uh, integration, if we want to reduce cultural friction, we should uh, promote exposure to other cultures. But there's a strange phenomenon, and it shows that in some cases exposure really works, and in other cases it doesn't work. Here's one hypothesis that I would like to propose, and it's based on the story that I will tell, that I've told you. Um, this is not something that's proven, so I should say this immediately. This is something that I think we should do research in, on, but the hypothesis is that um, we should look at the multitasking hypothesis, so to speak. So if exposure leads to a lot of multitasking strain, it is probably not going to help because people are people will backtrack, so to speak. They will remove themselves from the interaction with other culture. On the other hand, if you can organize exposure to other cultures in such a way that you do not ask too much of people's multitasking tolerance, so to speak, um, this is likely to be successful. So I will end with an example in which exactly this is attempted. This is a an architectural proposal. It's not been realized yet. It's an architectural proposal of building a um, a kind of floating park uh, near Amsterdam. Uh, but the idea here is that different cultures might have their own um, area, their own space, so to speak, but that the um, the spaces are connected in such a way that in order to you know get from A to B, you will pass on a day-to-day -day basis um, people from other cultures. So you become familiarized with uh, with these people without necessarily having to interact frequently uh, with uh, with these people. The project is called uh, Familiar Strangers. Uh, and the idea is that by becoming familiarized with uh, other conventions, you sort of let your guard, you will slowly let your guard down. Uh, and, and familiarization basically is what it is all about. It's, it's becoming, it's feeling... Uh, at ease with different conventions that really um, should do the trick if the story that I've been telling you is uh, correct. So that is what I wanted to, uh, to tell you. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for watching Mark Schlorser's lecture for Rapport Reflects at Home. We hope you enjoyed it and encourage you to share your thoughts in the comment section below. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our YouTube channel. For more information about our upcoming programs, keep an eye on our website ru.nl slash and follow us on social media. See you next time.